Welcome everyone. We're going to get started in just about 30 seconds. We're letting everyone join into the webinar. Uh, people are streaming in right now. It looks like so far we've got 120 attendees. So I'm gonna get started with the introduction. I'm Marnie Smith from the Burlington Public Library. Thank you for joining us tonight and welcome to the second program of our five part monthly art series with Jane O'Neill. On the first Thursday of each month from now until April, Jane will explore an art, art topic. Tonight's program is titled John Singer Sargent, Master with a Brush. Next month on January 6th, Jane's program is titled Frenemies, the Art World's Greatest Rivalries. Frenemies will examine the ways some of the world's greatest artists challenged and competed with each other for commissions, sales, and status. This series is a collaboration of the Burlington Public Library, Tewksbury Public Library, and Stevens Memorial Library in North Andover. I would like to thank the friends group of each of these three libraries for general, generously sponsoring this series. Now I'm delighted to welcome Jane O'Neill. Jane is the owner and creator of Culturally Curious, an arts education firm that curates and delivers engaging art talks to audiences throughout New England. She's an independent scholar and holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in art and education from Harvard University. Jane is a New Hampshire native and has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director, and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane has also taught art history at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at South Southern New Hampshire University. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat and Jane will answer your questions at the end of the program. So Jane, I'm so excited for tonight's program. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Marnie, for inviting me back and for coordinating everything for this for tonight's program. Thank you everybody for joining us. I am just so honored to be able to share tonight's program with you. And I am delighted that you're curious in the subject. So let's dive right in. We have this gorgeous image on the screen that you've probably been feasting your eyes on for the past minute or so. Um, these absolutely stunning women in these gorgeous dresses. And I think this is a big part of the appeal when it comes to John Singer Sargent. But I wanted to start off with a little bit of a preamble because I think a lot of people in the greater Boston area sort of feel this connection to John Singer Sargent. We probably all have our Sargent stories. Um, my story is that I think he really helped to kickstart my love for art history. Uh, many of you might remember 1999, the summer of Sargent in Boston, seeing the, um, the, the big Sargent show at the Museum of Fine Arts was like a revelation for me. I just absolutely loved it. And then my first job out of college was at the Boston Public Library, uh, where I worked for the foundation that raised money to restore the Sargent murals. And then from there, I started giving tours at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, which obviously has um, some great sergeants in the collection. And, um, and it was a place where he himself worked uh, nearly a, a century before I was there. So I always felt a deep appreciation for his work 
and um, and this connection to it in, in a special way. So I'm really excited to share these images with you tonight. So let's um, zoom out on this image just for a moment so that we can get uh, the full uh, experience of the Wyndham sisters here. Uh, this was painted in 1899. So this is like Sargent at the height of his powers. And these uh, this completely luxurious setting and these three sisters who are wearing um, absolutely stunning white gowns. And you, you get a sense of the materials here, like the chiffons and the silks and the satins and that sort of thing, lounging on this couch in the way that every Vanity Fair cover uh, aspires to recreate these days. Well, Sargent's uh, almost 10 foot tall painting made quite the impression. And I want to just draw your attention to the fact that these three sisters really only take up half of the canvas. The rest of it is pretty shadowy. In fact, he reserved a lot of the canvas or a lot of the space in the back to um, portray a, a, a painting of these three sisters mother. So it was sort of establishing this important genealogy there, as if you didn't already know that they were rich and important from the way he painted them. Um, it's reinforced by the by the backdrop. This um, was met with with um, great sort of fanfare when it was unveiled, people loved it. The Prince of Wales referred to it as the three graces, who wouldn't want to look like this, right? I will say that it, um, it sort of flies in the face from the tradition in uh, uh, from the tradition way one would paint a family <laughs> and if we go back about a hundred years we're looking at uh, the painter the American painter Charles Wilson Peel and his self-portrait with his family and I'll just draw your attention to the fact that here people are interacting with each other they're touching each other they're smiling there's a sense of warmth here but that is not at all what Sargent was aiming for with his picture over here. These are in so many ways, simply portrayals of, of power and, um, and beauty, it's absolutely stunning beauty. And so we'll have a lot of fun tonight taking that in. All right, so here is how we will move through the material. I'll give a, a, an, an overview and introduction to John Singer Sargent. We'll focus on his early career, and then we'll look at how he kind of dabbles in all of these different styles. I call him a cultural chameleon, and we'll see how he um, experiments and, and sort of adopts elements of different styles early on in his career. And then his, uh, his, his uh, career as an artist just takes off, in, in part because he really does have friends in all the right places, these incredible connections that help to just catapult him forward. Afterwards, he gets a little tired of portrait painting, as many of you might know, and so he takes on some major works. We'll take a, a look at that and we'll finish up with his watercolors. So we've got a lot to cover. I'm pretty ambitious in, in what we're going to cover tonight. I will give this uh, short sort of warning. On the screen here is my all-time favorite John Singer Sargent painting, Lady Agnew of Loch from 1892. This is at the Scotland um, uh, National Gallery of Art. And I wanted to, I, I, when I first envisioned this program, I thought it was going to be all of these gorgeous images of really beautiful women wearing beautiful clothes. And as I was putting that program together, I realized that I was getting sort of too deep into who the women were and what their backstories were. And we were getting too far away from the art. That being said, I needed to include them in some way. So this is how I've done it. I've put them on title slides for each of these sections so we can still see some of these incredible dresses and get a sense of these beautiful women. But sometimes the backstories get us too far away from what he, from, um, from what he was doing in terms of making art. So this is um, Mrs. Henry White from 1882. That's at the National Gallery of Art. You've got to love this dress that she's wearing. All right, and so, um, so the quote here too gives us a sense in terms of how Sargent painted and we're going to be learning a little bit more about that now. So John Singer Sargent was essentially an expatriate nomad growing up. His, um, his parents were Americans, his father was born in Gloucester and was an eye doctor, but uh, essentially they, they moved to Europe and spent most of their time traveling with the seasons and they had um, several children while they were there and 
John Singer Sargent is uh, depicted here with a younger sister. And so he got this kind of unusual education in that he was sort of trained by going to churches and some of the greatest museums in Europe. Formal education didn't quite stick because they were moving around so much. But he was um, receiving a, a lot of information about essentially how to be a, a real gentleman. I mean, he was learning about literature. He was learning about art and music, and he was learning all these different languages, English, French, Italian, German. So he was um, a quite learned young man by the age of 18. Um, he always showed an interest in the arts, and we'll uh, explore that a little bit more in just a moment. But I wanted to share with you these self-portraits. The first on the left is from about the age of 20, and the next one is from about 30 years later. I should mention to you that Sargent was born in 1856. Um, so if we think of him as right around 1850, it gives us a, a good sort of anchor for um, for how old he is and where he is in his career. So he, he goes on to be the leading portrait painter of his generation. And he was sort of a society portrait painter, um, a painter of royals and that sort of thing. And in the 20th century, most art historians really weren't interested in those kinds of painters. And it's really only been in the past few decades that art historians have turned their attention back to John Singer Sargent uh, um, for a number of reasons, but particularly because of his incredible, masterful skill with a brush. And you can see how it dramatically evolves over the course of his life too. Um, the way he captures um, light and shadow, particularly on his face in the second portrait here is just incredible. So over the course of about a 50 year career, he produces 900 oil paintings and about 2000 watercolors in addition to hundreds of more sketches. So he was pretty prolific. Um, and we'll see that he never really settles down either. He's always traveling, always moving. Uh, he lives to the age of 69 and he dies in his sleep. Um, and during his lifetime, he becomes pretty famous in his own right and uh, a larger than life figure, I should say. And we can even see in the press and in the cartoons here as his um, reputation grows, apparently so did his waistline, at least in caricatures here. So let's turn our attention to his early training as an artist. He um, initially sought to, um, to, to get training in Florence, but because um, things were changing there, he and his family went to Paris and he was accepted into the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, the most prominent uh, art school in the country. And while he was getting um, this really sort of rigorous formal training in drawing and underpainting um, at, at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, he also began to study under um, this man over here on the left, whose name was Carolus Duran. And he um, had a completely different approach to painting that we'll see has a tremendous impact on John Singer Sargent. His approach to painting is called a la prima, which means, you know, we're not going to do any drawing, we're not going to do any underpainting, we are just going to apply this, um, this brush that is loaded up with paint and do these kind of masterful strokes on the canvas canvas um, without all of this preparation. And the result is um, this kind of stunning effect, particularly when we're thinking about the fabrics that really rich people would be wearing. So this is an example of Carolus Duran's painting over here on the right. Um, this is from 1876. And of course, this is exactly the kind of work that John Singer Sargent becomes known for, for, for creating in his career. When he was done his studies with Carolus Duran in to sort of uh, graduate and to sort of say thank you to his mentor, he creates this stunning portrait of him that many of you have probably seen at the Clark Art Institute. This is from 1879. And so Sargent was just 23 years old when he painted this. So let's appreciate this on a couple of different levels. The, um, the ability to capture the, the realistic details of the face here are pretty stunning. I mean, this is a pretty much a spot on portrait in so many ways. But now let's also move away from the face and appreciate this kind of 
buttery brushwork that he uses um, in order to capture or suggest the textures of the coat and, um, and the ruffled sleeves down here and the pants and even um, the, this wooden cane in, in his hand. All of these different textures are suggested with um, um, not precise detail, but instead uh, this, this really kind of free flowing thick and heavy paint. Uh, John Singer Sargent wrote a, a, a little um, uh, inscription thanking his, his teacher from here. And, um, and for the most part, this was a, a greatly appreciated um, portrait when it was unveiled. But there are always critics, and I will always show you <laughs> whenever um, his works were criticized, because it's always interesting to see how, um, how the contemporary press thought of his work. So in this case, they, they sort of thought he made his mentor look a little too I don't know, demonic, satanic, <laughs> but but we know it, it, as compared to the photograph, it was pretty spot on. All right, so let's turn our attention to this notion of John Singer Sargent being a cultural chameleon. He, now we know he's gotten essentially the best training one could get. He has been perfectly prepared to paint the portraits of the very wealthy, of the elite. And that is, of course, who we see here on the title slide. This is Betty Wertheimer from 1908. This is in the Smithsonian's collection. Don't you just love this sort of iridescent effect on her dress over here? So, um, so once again, the quote here is, is uh, speaking to his, his method as he's creating these works of art, um, how he loads up his brush so much. So we're going to look at how he's dabbling in different styles at this early phase of his career where he's just kind of launching himself. So after he finishes his studies, he does some travels around Northern Africa. And he, and I, I guess really the most important work that comes out of these travels is this one here here, which is called The Smoke of Ambergris from 1880. We're so lucky because this one is also fairly nearby at the Clark Art Institute. He painted this when he was just 24 years old. Now, at the time, this would have been considered a very exotic subject matter. <laughs> this was um, a, essentially a, a woman that he found to, to pose for him, um, but a picture that, I, if I remember correctly, he sort of created later. But, um, but the setting here, the clothing, what she's doing here, she's sort of shrouding her head to, um, in order to inhale the smoke from the sensor here, or, um, or at least uh, the, the um, the, the, the sense from the sensor and, and what she was doing here, this ambergris was considered to have, a, considered to be sort of like an aphrodisiac in some way. So this was considered a very sensual image. Now, this is also a really masterful attempt at painting at such a young age, because I'll draw your attention to the fact that it's painted almost entirely in white. Now, imagine, if you will, somebody asking you to make a painting, and then they just push some whites and grays and tans in front of you. Imagine that challenge right there. Well, this was really a challenge that a lot of artists and American expatriate artists were kind of um, caught up in in the later half of the 19th century. You have James McNeil Whistler over here on the right from 1863 with his portrait of the little white girl, which is another white on white painting that sort of caused a sensation for the day. It is a way to sort of say, I am a master. <laughs> and John Singer Sargent was doing this when he was just 24 years old. One critic who, um, who saw the painting shortly after it was unveiled referred to it quite simply as being a perfect piece of painting. So she's elegant, the whole, and, and exotic in, in their eyes, and the whole piece just sang. So let's turn our attention to a work that is probably very familiar to most here, and that is um, a painting called El Haleo that's at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. This was painted in 1888 when John Singer Sargent was just 26 years old. So we already know he went to Africa. This is a result of his travels in Spain. And, um, and a lot of things happened when he was in Spain. First and foremost, he goes to to the Prado, and he sees work by Spanish masters from centuries before him. And they weren't painting white on white paintings. Instead, they're really interested in these inky black 
paintings that we see over here. Now imagine somebody handing you uh, just a couple pots of black paint and saying, make me a painting or paint me a perfect dress or an outfit this way. And that is what artists like Diego Velasquez could do. And John Singer Sargent was inspired. So in the 1880s, he begins to create these paintings that have a lot of inky black to them, like El Haleo here. Now there's a lot going on in this painting that also references his travels in Spain at this time. Um, but I'll start with this by saying, um, well, okay, so I let's let's focus in on just a few of the things that are happening in this picture. When I used to give tours at the Gardner Museum, we would always say, this painting is the loudest painting in Boston. Let's talk about some of the noises that we hear coming out of this painting. And this was a fun conversation to have with adults and with kids. Um, inevitably, you talk about the clapping, you talk about the guitars, maybe the stomping of, of the, the dancer here, maybe you hear castanets, um, but over here, the, this central figure whose head is thrown back, people always misinterpreted him as sleeping. But when it comes to um, flamenco dancing, uh, there's uh, always a singer that goes along with it who is just belting out at the top of his lungs. And that's really probably the loudest person in this scene. And John Singer Sargent wanted to draw our attention to how loud it was. So follow me with this. He puts a lot of sort of secret symbols on the back wall of this picture, inspired by his travels to uh, around Spain, and in particular to caves where he saw prehistoric man painting on the walls. So if you have really good eyes back here, you can even see the, um, the suggestion of like a bull from an ancient um, uh, cave painting. Here over here, a handprint. That's the sort of thing that you would see in a prehistoric cave painting. And if you go all the way to the other side of the picture, over these girls' heads over here, he's painted the word ole, ole. Again, Again and again, which is something I don't think he does in any other of his pictures. It's a really kind of um, modern thing to do to include text in his images this way. But that's just another reminder of how loud this picture is. In addition to the singing, the stomping, the castanets, the guitars, you can imagine everybody in this scene screaming out, ole, 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 um, along with this uh, incredible dancer who is um, so, so striking. Um, and it being uplit like the way that she is. All right, so Spain has had a huge influence on um, John Singer Sargent. And then he goes to France and in France, everything changes. It's not about white on white. It's not about inky blacks. Now it's all about impressionism. And this is quite a remarkable picture here. This is John Singer Sargent's painting of Claude Monet painting at the edge of a wood from 1885. So John Singer Sargent is really getting around and he's clearly connecting with all the right people. This painting's at the Tate Modern. So imagine being this young man, this, you know, this upstart in the art world and to be able to sit next to Claude Monet and create paintings together. And we can see Claude Monet has completely inspired a shift in the way that John Singer Sargent has painted. This entire picture looks as though he's attempting impressionism here. It's um, these short, quick, broken, brush strokes. He's not trying to cr really create the illusion of leaves on trees. He's just um, creating the, the, the sensory sort of impression. John Singer Sargent was so proud of this work. Oh, I do have this detail over here too. This is actually the painting that Monet was painting in this scene. Now, John Singer Sargent was so proud of this painting, and I think so proud of the fact that he was sitting next to Monet that... Um, that instead of giving this painting to Monet, which is like this tradition in artistic circles, if, if you paint each other, you uh, exchange portraits. Instead, Sargent held on to this one. I think it was a little bit of a badge of art honor. And for the next few years, he continues to create works that look awfully similar to what the Impressionist artists were doing. It's not sort of perfectly Impressionist in every way, but, um, but you can see here, 
with this lovely picture of two women asleep in the boat under the willows from 1887. He's using this strong diagonal over here. This is a very popular um, compositional device that, that um, impressionists use. And then those willows too are really sort of dashed off very quickly in the same uh, rapid execution that um, an impressionist would use. And you can compare this to um, Monet's boat from the same year. And it's uh, it's got a lot in common with it to, uh, uh, to say the least. One other painting that is um, really just so striking from this little impressionist period that John Singer Sargent has is a painting of a fellow artist, Paul Hillieu, and his uh, and his wife from 1889. So there's a good few years where he's going back to this style. But the way that they're sitting in, in these tall grasses that, again, are um, rapidly executed, um, skillfully executed, I would say, uh, and, and give this great sense of, of this space in nature that they're occupying, but still has this strong diagonal, that compositional device here. It makes it just such a really impressive work. And this one is at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. So he's connected to the Impressionists. He's really absorbing what they're doing. He's sitting there painting with them. But then everything changes again. <laughs> John Singer Sargent spends some time in England. <laughs> and a lot of times people look at this incredible picture here and they think he's still doing that Impressionist thing. The Impressionists love flowers, they love the outdoors, but I would argue that this is really different. I think that he's in a new location and he's thinking of a different influence at this point. So right now we are looking at his painting called Carnation Lily Lily Rose from 1885 to 86. This, um, this painting was actually, it had like a mixed reception. People actually called this a Frenchified style. But like I said, I think he was, uh, he was influenced by something else. I, I think he had been exposed at this point to the pre-Raphaelite painters who were so focused on minute detail in the natural world. Um, Millet's Ophelia is probably the best example over here from 1852. And we can see this uh, incredible attention to every single blade of grass and every single flower that floats along with this character from, um, from Hamlet. And I think perhaps Sargent had that in his mind as he was creating this really um, detailed work over here. So he's trying to capture a very specific quality of light at a very specific time of day. And unlike the Impressionists who were working very rapidly, trying to capture momentary effects of light and shadow, finish up a painting in a day, John Singer Sargent spent months on this picture and he would only work on it for a few minutes a day when the, when the light was right. So imagine this, he's staying with his friends, he's out and he's playing tennis, the tennis game stops, he runs over to his easel, gathers up his models, paints a little bit and then goes back and, um, and enjoys the company of his friends. But I think the end result is something really magnificent. The, these glowing lanterns, um, these different sort of registers of these beautiful flowers here, and then these angelic children in the foreground. It's just a, a really stunning picture. But I think the process of creating it frustrated John Singer Sargent at some point, because I do remember reading it at one point, he, instead of calling it Carnation Lily Lily, Lily Rose, which was um, the name of a song, he started calling it Tarnation Silly Silly Pose. <laughs> so um, let's turn our attention now to um, some of his social connections. And we can see he's already got this ability to kind of fall in with the right people. Um, and so now we're really kind of delving into his career as a portrait painter. We've got another stunning woman in a beautiful dress on our title slide here. Um, this is Mrs. Hugh Hammersley from 1892. This is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I'm fairly certain this is a red velvet dress that she's wearing. You can almost feel the velvet as you're looking at it. Um, and then we go to this quote from Sargent where a painting, a portrait is a painting where there's something wrong with the mouth. And I think you can sort of get that sense with Mrs. Hugh Hammersley here. So he's, he's kind of indicating like his little trick when it comes to creating something that has this, um, um, 
this lasting appeal to it, or at least keeps you looking. So at this point in Sargent's career, he's still a young man, um, but he is doing extraordinarily well. He's smart. He's got a great work ethic. He's multi-talented, and he's essentially doing the entire business himself. He's got a lot of confidence and, um, and could really kind of um, not flatter, uh, like personally flatter all of his, all of his um, subjects, although he was doing that in painting, but he could really get along with them and keep a conversation going or be kind of entertaining while he painted. So what we see over here in the cartoon is all the ladies lining up at his studio on Tite Street in order to get sergeanted. Um, and we can see him looking out the, out the window, not exactly excited about the whole thing. Now, um, he was making about $130,000 off of each of these portraits, and he would paint about 14 of them a year. So he was doing extraordinarily well for himself. And now we shift gears and take a look at some of the extraordinary people he was painting. Um, it really gives you a sense that, uh, you know, you paint one of these people and it probably opened the doors to, um, you know, the next 10 that you're going to paint. John Singer Sargent painted several U.S. Pre presidents. We see um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson here. Um, Teddy Roosevelt was painted in 1903. John Singer Sargent was invited to the White House to create a portrait of Roosevelt. And apparently Roosevelt was just um, not interested in sitting and posing. Um, and so the two of them were actually kind of quarreling, apparently. And, um, and, and Roosevelt was kind of storming away. And, and Sargent was so frustrated. It's like, how am I going to make a picture if you don't sit down? And Roosevelt turned back around, put his hand on the Newell post, and then said something to Sargent. And Sargent said, just hold that pose, because this is how I'm going to paint you. He goes goes from the White House to the biggest house in America, the biggest privately owned house in America. Um, and that is the Vanderbilt Mansion, the Biltmore Estate down in Asheville, North Carolina. And he has um, some important work to do there because he is asked to create portraits of the architect and the landscape architect of this massive, impressive home. So over here on the left is his portrait of Richard Morris Hunt from 1895. This is at the Biltmore Estate. And Frederick Law, Ols Ols uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, also from 1895, and this is also at the Biltmore Estate. Um, but these two, th these two architects, essentially, have incredible New England connections as well. You've probably visited the Marble House down in um, in Newport, Rhode Island, or um, or spent time in the Emerald Necklace Park system in Boston. So, so these men have had a tremendous influence, particularly on 19th century architecture and landscape architecture. And so what a coup for, for uh, John Singer Sargent to be able to paint their portraits um, sort of towards the end of their careers. Uh, one of the criticisms of the Richard Morris Hunt painting is that maybe Sargent was a little bit more interested in this fountain than he was in his subject over here. Um, and with Olmsted's picture, he appropriately places him in this outdoor setting um, to, in order to celebrate this, this famed landscape architect. So we move from these, um, these leaders in, in uh, the American arts to, uh, back to Monet. Sargent painted another portrait of Claude Monet. This one is from 1887. It's at the National Academy of Design. Here's a self-portrait by Monet from just a year earlier. So you can see it's very similar in appearance, but Sargent is no longer trying to emulate Monet's style here. He's really doing it in his his own sort of grand manner portraiture style. But I like that he puts him in, in profile here. It's almost as though he's holding him up like a leader on a coin or something like that. He's that important, at least to the arts, of course, and, um, uh, and probably personally to um, John Singer Sargent as well. From, uh, from a painter, he goes to a sculptor. This is Auguste Rodin, who everybody knows for being the, um, the creator of the famous Thinker statue. And I absolutely love this portrait of Rodin with this red beer, beard and the arched eyebrow. He looks like he's having a very engaging conversation with John Singer Sargent. But again, these incredible flourishes that Sargent uses in terms of brushwork, just notice that, um, that the red 
red, even in his hair, are just these little dashes and dabs of color. He's not trying to create uh, um, the uh, illusion of individual strands, strands here. He's doing this in a very kind of loose, buttery, masterful way. All right, we go from the arts to the world of literature. And this is his portrait of Henry James from 1913. This is shortly after James had been nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature. He's sort of at the top of his game. He's already published Wings of the Dove and Turn of the Screw. And just to give you a sense in terms of how John Singer Sargent could really flatter his subjects sometimes, if we compare this to a photograph of James from around the same time, John Singer Sargent really makes him look like a statesman. He looks like somebody who should be respected um, and somebody who is, um, is admirable in, in, um, in so many ways, but particularly for the strength of his intellect, for the sense of command here. Um, that I think that all really comes together in the way that he has sort of spotlit the face in, in this particular portrait. Another author that he portrayed was Robert Louis Stevenson. And this is where we begin to see John Singer Sargent experimenting in unusual ways, uh, mostly in composition, um, to varying degrees of success, I would say. So I think that this is an endlessly fascinating portrait of Robert Louis Stevenson and his wife. This is from 1885. Robert Louis Stevenson um, was apparently a, a, a sort of a high energy person. He didn't want to sit down for this portrait. But um, John Singer Sargent was willing to sort of capture him as he's pacing the room. And he includes it, well, he creates this strange composition with the open door into this shadowy back hallway with the staircase leading up that kind of separates Stevenson away from his wife, who is cut off by the edge of the picture here. And she's sort of strangely shrouded as she's sitting in this chair, disconnected from her husband. Um, just to give you a sense in terms of how close John Singer uh, Sargent was in his portrayal of Robert Louis Stevenson, I think he, he really kind of captures his essence here. But the compositional choices are really sort of strange. Uh, and perhaps he's just got this virtuoso talent, just enough of it and, a lot, uh, and enough of the ego to go along with it that he's willing to experiment. And I think perhaps the best example of this kind of experimentation is with um, Boston's, one of Boston's favorite pictures, which is um, his portrait of the daughters of Edward Darley Boyd from 1882. And I have to say, this is a favorite picture of mine as well. It's just so endearing and so appealing in so many ways. But of course, um, this is a work that everybody really questioned when it was first unveiled. Um, these are the daughters of uh, expatriate friends of his who were also in, interested in the arts. And imagine commissioning a portrait of your children where you can't even see all of their faces. I mean, when we think of portraits, we think of school picture day and everybody lined up looking their absolute best. But here you have the kids sort of withdrawn on. They're not necessarily smiling. One of them is turned away from you. But um, after people sort of got over the shock of, of this um, composition, they began to appreciate it in new ways. Because of course, John Singer Sargent is really showing us these different stages of life and how young children interact with adults in, um, in a very realistic way, I would say. I every every time I see a small child sitting like this on the floor now, I always think of this picture. But when we see a child who's three or four years old, they're curious, they're interested in the people that have walked in the room if they're not terrified of them. So there's a little bit of apprehension here, but that curiosity. Um, with the girl who's slightly older, she's standing back, her hands are behind her, behind her back, and she's also curious. She's probably having a conversation, but she's a little bit more guarded, a little bit more reserved. And then we get to these two older girls who are probably just on the cusp of being teenagers. And like all teenage girls, they want nothing to do with us, right? So they are moving back into the shadows. They're turning their bodies away. Um, they are not going to engage with you in the same way that these younger children are. Um, so there's, it, it's like this profound commentary on on the stages of childhood, which you wouldn't normally see 
in a portrait commission. So if you've gone to the MFA, you've probably seen their brilliant installation here where the picture is um, flanked by those giant vases in the picture, um, which have apparently crossed the Atlantic Ocean, I don't know, several dozen times, and it's uh, uh, miraculous that they're still in one piece. Uh, uh, one of the criticisms, of course, of this work of art was that John Singer Sargent focused way too much on the vases and not enough on the girls, but it's had uh, some real staying power and, and people oftentimes cite this work as being one of their favorites. Art historians love to compare it to the Diego Velasquez masterpiece called Las Meninas that was painted way back in 1656. And this is a work that Sargent would have seen when he went to the Prado. Um, earlier on in his career. So you have the Infanta over here, the, the little princess who's sitting, standing right at the center here, engaging us directly, um, very similar to this young girl in the foreground of Sargent's painting. So there's a lot here to appreciate. We could probably spend the, the rest of the hour just on this comparison here, but we'll move along um, to, uh, to this next section here where we're going to delve into a few of the scandals of John Singer Sargent's career. Every time I paint a portrait, I lose a friend, he says. Here's another gorgeous woman in a beautiful dress. I love this kind of um, uh, black lace that comes down over her lap like this. This is Madame Ramon Subercasso from 1881. All right, so what are these scandals? Oh, I remember seeing this, this painting like it was yesterday when it was at the MFA in 1999. This picture I found shocking, even when I was in my late teens or early 20s. Um, it is, there, there's just something, of course, all this red draws your eye right to it. Um, and it confuses you because at first glance, you think that this is a religious figure, a cardinal or something, but instead it's this very striking, very handsome young man um, who was a doctor. He was actually a gynecologist. This is Dr. Potsy at home from 1881. And, and people were pretty scandalized by this portrait of um, this respectable young man who people would have thought would be painted in formal attire like we see in this photograph. But instead he's wearing sort of like the equivalent of a house coat, I guess here, that looks like it's kind of barely hanging on to his his body. He's got these elegant long fingers and he's got, he's sort of clutching this, this, um, this uh, uh, robe closed at, at, at the neck or at the chest here, but you notice it's also tied at his hips and his other hand with those long fingers is pulling at that rope, almost suggesting like he's trying to pull it open. So there's um, a, an incredible sensuality to this picture that you don't normally see in portraits of men, <laughs> but it sets us up for the big scandal <laughs> that everyone is familiar with. And in my mind, mind these pictures like they just belong together um, and that is the scandal of Madame X of course. So Madame X also known as Madame Pierre Gautreau um, was the subject of this famous portrait from 1884. She was 25 when it was painted. John Singer Sargent was just 28. He was really trying to establish himself, perfectly establish himself as the premier society painter of his day. Um, when he, when he uh, uh, well, essentially won the opportunity to paint her. Um, but as we'll see, the reception was a little, <laughs> a little colder than he had hoped. So I'll start by saying that she was another expatriate. She was an American, but living in Paris and, um, and sort of just famous for being beautiful. She was an unusual beauty and, pe and people talked about her. Our um, artists essentially hunted her like a deer. They all wanted to paint her. So, I, I mean, it really was pretty um, impressive and amazing for John Singer Sargent to win the opportunity to paint her. And so uh, he worked with her for more than a year trying to finish this picture. There's a lot of sketches of her. Uh, he referred to her as um, the unpaintable beauty and hopeless laziness of Madame Goutreau. So there's a lot of, of images of her just kind of lazing about. Um, so you, you get the sense that there was a struggle here in trying to um, 
uh, match up the artistic ambitions and um, and the will of the subject here. But uh, as you go through his sketches, his um, watercolors, then we get closer to what that finished oil painting looked like. And I, I'm sure there isn't a, one of you here tonight that hasn't already heard the story of how he's put her in this incredible dress, this kind of heart-shaped bodice um, that would have had like whalebone sort of bringing her in. Notice how tiny her waist is here and this long black skirt. And, um, and he decides to put her in profile to, to accentuate this kind of unusual um, uh, beauty that she was. She was also very pale. She would actually kind of powder her skin to look lavender. So there was a lot about her that looked unusual um, and really striking. But for Sargent, the big, um, the big scandal was the fact that he painted this dress with the strap originally falling off. And this was just considered so over the top and so unnecessarily sensual for a picture that was already beautiful and sensual in so many ways. Um, it, that, that sensuality, that added sensuality was considered garish. It was considered in really poor taste. So this created a real sort of negative, a, a real negative se sensation around this work. And this is kind of a dated reference at this point, but probably a decade ago now, there was some award show where Angelina Jolie showed up in kind of a similar black dress and it had a very high slit and she kept popping her leg out and sort of flexing her leg muscles, showing off her leg. And it became this kind of immediate joke because she's already so beautiful in so many ways that, I mean, people were just laughing that she didn't have to show off her leg. Like we already know she's beautiful. And that was sort of the thing that was happening with M Madam X too. You don't have to put the strap down because we already know she's sensual and gorgeous. Now, not everybody agreed. Um, some of the, car the caricatures in the press didn't make her out to be quite as beautiful as maybe Sargent had hoped. Um, and like I said, this really didn't attract the kind of attention he was hoping um, at this point in his career, but he was attached to this painting. He actually kept it with him for um, the next 36 years, and he ended up selling it to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and he wrote to the director, I suppose it is the best thing I have ever done, um, which is really saying a lot. Uh, a, a sort of postscript on Madame Gautreau, several other artists painted her um, during the course of her life. Here are just a few of them, artists whose names have um, uh, are probably not familiar to most, but I will just say, if you had to choose among any of these, you know, if, if, if which work was the best, which work would you want to represent who you are? I think I would have stuck with the sergeant. So um, not to be outdone when it comes to scandals, uh, we turn our attention to Isabella Stewart Gardner, who of course we all know as the creator of that wonderful museum down in Boston. And um, here we see her in a photograph. She was very rarely photographed. She, um, I don't think she was entirely comfortable with her uh, appearance, but she loved to have her portrait. Uh, painted. So just a few years after Madame X was painted, four years to be exact, uh, uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner commissions her friend, John Singer Sargent, to paint her portrait. And at this point, uh, she is closing in on 50 years old, and Sargent is about 32. So let's take a look at this work of art. This was such a fun picture to teach when I was giving tours at the Gardner Museum. Um, so there's a lot going on here. And I don't think when we look at it with our contemporary eyes, we immediately imagine what's scandalous about this picture. But um, when it was exhibited at the St. Batalf's Club in Boston in 1888, it, uh, it created an uproar. First and foremost, probably, was this um, background. It's actually a fragment of a tapestry that's in the Gardner collection. And it certainly makes Mrs. Gardner look as though she has a halo over her head. Um, critics even said, who does she think she is some sort of Byzantine Madonna. Um, there, it, you could even extrapolate maybe a crown over her head, maybe even angel wings coming out of that um, tiny waist of hers. But um, the other elements of the way she's presenting herself here too were also pretty scandalous. Um, the fact that she's wearing pearls, not just at her neck, but at her waist, two strands at her waist, who does that? And there's rubies. There's one here, 
two here and then two on her shoes. Kids always notice those two rubies. Um, and the dress was considered too, like too new, too en vogue to be wearing in Boston, but it was really those bare arms that just, um, that just really ruffled feathers at the time. So here's just a quick view of Mrs. Gardner here, um, just to get a sense in terms of what an artist could do for her face that she didn't like, or she didn't think that the camera could do for her. Um, that scandal that was caused, well, it resulted with her husband asking that this painting never be portrayed in public or displayed in public again for the rest of his life. She went beyond that and she never displayed it in public again for the rest of her life. So this Gothic room, the kind of final stop in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum where she installed her painting was always off limits until after her death, which I think was in 1924. She did allow John Singer Sargent to use that room as a studio space. And so here he is painting a portrait, a, such a lovely portrait of a mother and daughter. This is Mrs. Fisk Warren. This is in the collection of the MFA in Boston painted in 1903. I particularly love this kind of out take photograph where you can see that they're all smiling and having a really good time too. All right, so we turn our attention to Sargent's lofty ambitions, his major works. He gets sick of painting portraits at a certain point, I should say. So, um, he also gets into some hot water with all of this. The lovely woman in this stunning dress over here is Mrs. George Swinton from 1897. I think we'll be seeing her a little bit later too. And um, so let's turn our attention to these bigger goals that Sargent had in terms of painting. When we think of most great painters, we think of major works. We don't just think of portrait painting. Um, that was a niche that, uh, that John Singer Sargent didn't want to be relegated to. So when we think of the, the McKim building, the, uh, the flagship building for the Boston Public Library in Copley Square, that was a building that was going to be outfitted with murals by some of the, the best artists of the day. And John Singer Sargent, these are um, Pou, Pou, uh, Deschavon uh, uh, murals right here in the main stairwell. And John Singer Sargent sort of got the top spot literally on the top floor of the building where he had this enormous gallery space where he could paint. Um, he was uh, uh, inspired, I should say, by um, none other than Michelangelo in, in his subject matter for this picture or for this mural cycle because even though this is a library setting, he decided on the subject of the triumph of religion for this project. And he spent about 30 years putting it together, um, not painting on site, but in his studio. This is a view in terms of how he um, would set up these canvases in his studio, and then he would come back and deliver them and install them at the library. Now we could, of course, spend hours, if not days or weeks, just on this cycle of murals. It's, I mean, they are absolutely awe-inspiring, incredibly complex images um, about the history of art, about the history of religion. Um, here we see, you know, pharaoh, Egyptian pharaohs and Assyrian gods, and um, everything is overlapping and intersecting and interweaving in really complicated, wonderful ways. And then he's done gold relief uh, throughout the whole mural cycle too. So, um, so there are literally layers to um, to the complexity of this mural cycle. Now, this is nowhere near as grand in scale as uh, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. The ceiling's certainly not as high, and he doesn't cover anywhere near um, the amount of square footage. But that's not to say that there isn't um, just incredible work done here. Now, I want to draw your attention to um, this archway over here that goes over your head as you're standing on the third floor of the Boston Public Library, because this is one of the strangest, most wonderful passages of painting I've ever seen. And it's complicated. So this is kind of flattening it all out. This is the edge of, of one ceiling or sort of the edge of one wall over here and the edge of the other. And this is arching over our heads. But you can see he's using different deities here, um, referencing um, different uh, uh, religious uh, systems of belief. We've got um, this one figure here with these dark eyes and then this huge 
caller referencing um, the astrological signs. And this figure continues all the way down over here, but it also interlocks with this kind of ethereal blue deity over here. So I've kind of split the picture in half. I know it's a little bit hard to see, but as you're looking at it over and back again um, to see how he's um, kind of merged these figures together in a really smart and kind of mind-blowing way, there's just huge appreciation for what he has accomplished here. But it all ends up in scandal. <laughs> because of um, this painting over here, this painting over here, and the resulting empty wall in between. So what happens in his Triumph of Religion series is he creates an image essentially of, um, of like a Pieta, where we see uh, 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 Mary with uh, the uh, dead Christ who has come down off the cross. We see his wounds here in the crown of thorns. And this is simply called church. But there's a sense of triumph with this with this image of Mary enthroned. Compare this to uh, Sargent's depiction of synagogue, which is just opposite this. And we see a figure in a crumbling tent with a crown falling off of her head. She's blindfolded and she has a broken scepter. Um, so uh, this seems very, it seems to have all the hallmarks of an anti-Semitic image, and that was how it was received. Um, someone even threw ink on it when it was unveiled. And so um, it caused such an uproar that essentially Sargent didn't finish the entire project. Uh, he argued that that was not what he was going for. He was referencing um, this figure from Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, this um, huge uh, Sybil figure. But I will say that this is certainly not one of Michelangelo's most beautiful figures uh, to be emulating. So uh, a complicated um, and sort of disappointing result uh, at the end of that project. Another major work that he took on was um, this huge painting in response to um, the uh, in, in response to World War One, and this is a picture called Gast from 1919. It's about 20 feet long, and it's at the Royal Academy of Arts. It, the year that it was unveiled, it was voted the picture of the year. I like this installation shot because you get a sense of this of the size here. So Sargent, who's been painting, you know, fancy ladies and fancy dresses, gives us a very different image with this and on such a, a larger scale. So here he's really showing the human and emotional fallout after uh, the, the horrors of, of a very modern war, a war where chemical warfare was employed. So all of these figures have been um, have been blinded with mustard gas. And what we see is a column of soldiers who are headed towards the right. We see the guide wires of a medical tent that is just outside of the frame. And it's literally the blind leading the blind in this new, this new reality of their lives as they're going to seek medical attention. And so we see them trying to move forward. Our hearts sort of go into our throats as we imagine what they're experiencing. And then our eyes move around and we see even more of these figures that are still lying down, um, looking for help. Another column of, uh, of soldiers in a line headed towards that, that medical tent. And, and this picture has a huge impact on each and every viewer because of, of just how he's shown the impact of war on these figures. So we'll move from the, that hard reality of war to um, this last section here, the, the watercolor section. But we still have a beautiful lady in a beautiful dress here. <laughs> this is Millicent Duchess of Sutherland from 1903. And John Singer Sargent's watercolors are for many um, their favorite part of his career, uh, the favorite part of his artistic output. So he's had it with portraits. <laughs> he never wants to paint another portrait. And so at this point, later on in his life, he gets to travel and he gets to go to where he wants to go with his friends. He never really settles down, um, but he gets to see the world. Uh, for a time during World War I, he was a designated official war artist. And so we kind of see that he became accustomed to um, traveling 
lightly, you know, moving around with a skinny little easel like this and, and working on the fly. And that's sort of what he transitions into um, afterwards as well. He travels around and he sets up a little camp and he creates really stunning watercolors as a result. He goes really all over the world. This is Florida over here. This is Maine over here on the right. And we see um, that he is just as talented with watercolors as he is with oil paints. Um, and it's a whole different kind of technical skill that we see that he has just um, this incredible capability with. Um, every time I've ever tried watercolors, it's like everything's bleeding all over the page. It's just, I have no control. And so when I see little passages like this, that he can actually um, lay in this grid work on her skirt or, um, or these other sections here where he can just sort of mix these colors together so beautifully, overlay the, the little um, bits of yellow over here, you get the sense that he completely understands the medium. A few more images here. He oftentimes paints these like piles of women lying around waiting for him to finish his paintings. These are always like his friends. Um, and they look like they're just having these lovely afternoons, taking naps in the mountains as he's painting pictures. One of my favorite of, of John Singer Sargent's watercolors, I have to stop saying that because they're all my favorites, is this picture called Corfu, which was painted in Greece. Um, and it's all about this play of shadows on what's otherwise like a white building. And so we see these lovely colors coming in. I've always loved a little bit of fuchsia and blue down here. And, um, and it's just so beautifully done. It transports you to this place and this weather, this climate. And, and for as simple as it is, it really conveys so much. But for so many people, for art historians and, and the public alike, it's John Singer Sargent's paintings of Venice that really captured their hearts. For his Venice pictures, there is this incredible combination of the architecture of Venice, but then um, the fluidity, of course, of the, the water in the canals. So you can see he oftentimes kind of lays in the structure of the buildings with some drawing, but then you have this incredible sense of movement and light with the water um, and, and all the boats resting on top of the surface of the water. So just a few more of these Venice pictures. Now we all want to travel to Venice as we're looking at these. Um, but these blues too are just so stunning, so gorgeous. I mean, it really makes you feel like you're right there with him. Um, this is not Venice per se, but my other favorite John Singer Sargent watercolor painting is simply called White Ships from 1908. This is at the Brooklyn Museum. And here, I just think this is so virtuoso. He has described the water here with um, an economy of line and um, an economy of, of, of color really too. I mean, he's just using a few different colors of blue, but then he's even adding in the browns and the tans that we see up from up above in the ships. If I tried to do this, it would be a muddled mess, but you look at this and it looks like the surface of water. And then up above, it's just this chaos of the rigging of all of these boats. And then your eye lands on these like beautiful reflections of the light on the boats themselves. And, and you just see that this is a man that could capture what he was looking at in this truly magnificent way. So we'll finish up with his legacy. And what a legacy, what a mixed legacy, I should say. Um, this beautiful portrait of this incredible dress, this gorgeous woman. This is a portrait of Lady Helen Vincent in Venice. Um, this is at the Birmingham Museum of Art in Alabama. So our, our, um, our quote here is, I don't dig beneath the surface for things that don't appear before my own eyes. So that would indicate that there's a certain superficiality to John Singer Sargent's work, and that begins to be a part of the problem. So I want to share with you one of, well, the last oil painting, uh, last, last uh, portrait that he did in oil. Um, this is from 1925, and this is a work that you might have seen in person as well because it's in my hometown of um, Manchester, New Hampshire at the Courier Museum. So this is Grace Elvine. 
China. And doesn't she just look like she just stepped out of Downton Abbey? There is um, so much confidence in this pose, so many pearls, so much chiffon. It's just, it's a great painting. Um, if you just sit like her, just for a moment, you feel like her. <laughs> But this is completely out of step with what is happening in the art world in 1925. In 1925, you have artists like Kandinsky making non-objective paintings. You have Edward Hopper, who's creating these kind of um, haunting realist paintings. And then you have Picasso, who's deconstructing everything. <laughs> so John Singer Sargent looks really backwards in comparison. And some might even say sort of like a sellout too, who's really just focused on superficial beauty. So by the middle of the 20th century, the leading art critics of the time are just destroying his reputation. John Singer Sargent has died and um, and, you know, by 1950, honestly, you could buy a John Singer Sargent painting at auction for less than $300. But, but the quote here is from Lewis Mumford. And um, the, just the, the section I want to, to highlight here, um, concealed the, uh, the essential emptiness of Sargent's mind. Oh my goodness, this is like devastating. So things begin to change as we get towards the end of the 20th century. Um, this is Mrs. George Swinton, who we had seen before, but the painting here is by Rockwell. Um, everything comes back to Norman Rockwell for me. But in this picture here, he's really um, highlighting the, this kind of culture, the kind of cultural rev revolutions that were happening in the 1960s. So this is kind of uh, the, the backwards looking notion of femininity. And then we have um, this young upstart over here wearing blue jeans and looking at Picasso. So, um, so things begin to really shift as we get to somebody like Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol said, Sargent made everybody look glamorous, taller, thinner, but they all have a mood and every one of them has a different mood. Oh, when, when Andy Warhol starts to celebrate how beautiful somebody is, then you know you're in good company. So, um, so he probably helped to kind of bring on this wave of renewed Sargent appreciation. So in recent recent years, works um, like the ones on the screen have um, fetched millions of dollars. Um, this version of Robert Louis Stevenson went to the Crystal Bridges Museum for close to 10 million. The image over here on the right, um, a group with parasols sold for almost 25 million um, in 2004. And, um, and then of course, people flock to see these works when they're on view. I referenced the Summer of Sargent at the beginning of tonight's program. It was so popular back in 1999, this touring show of Sargent work, that the MFA stayed open 24 hours a day during its final weekend so that everybody who wanted to see it could get in to see it. So, um, so there's really sort of a craze around this. So what is this really all about? How do we understand our fascination with Sargent and his depictions of beautiful people and beautiful places and beautiful clothes? Well. I have a contemporary photograph here as a comparison. We've got our sergeant on the left in, with a picture called An Interior in Venice from 1899. And then over here, of course, we've got Ivanka Trump and her family um, in a sort of similarly opulent setting. And I think you can make the case that our current in interest in Sargent is the result of the fact that we're kind of going through another gilded age right now in America. Um, one critic recently wrote, the appeal, nay, the point of Sargent is beauty, extravagance, and the visual representation of social hierarchy. Now, nobody likes to, that, that, um, to be reinforced of where they are in the hierarchy if they're not that high. So I'm going to end on a very positive note with this gorgeous image of a Capri girl dancing on a rooftop from 1878. And I will say that even if these pictures reinforce this social hierarchy, what they're really doing for us is providing a little bit of escapism. They're all about fantasy. These pictures present to us a world of beauty, a world that is completely devoid of conflict and strife, 
and even work. <laughs> they are just absolutely feasts for our eyes. And Sargent had a talent for representing a world that we all wanted to be a part of. So I will end there for now. And I welcome any questions or comments anybody has about John Singer Sargent, and I'll do my best to try and answer them. All right, I'll start trying to go through some of these uh, notes in the chat. Patricia, I see your comment about the women and their backstories. Yes, I think I'll have to do that because everybody loves Sargent and it's really kind of fun to know those backstories. That's like the, um, the Downton Abbey version of, <laughs> of tonight's presentation. We can do that too. And it seems like there's some enthusiasm around it as well. All right. Thanks for the kind words that people have been sharing. I appreciate that. Was he paid by the painting throughout his career or did he have a consistent patron? That's a really good question. My hunch is that he was he was getting paid as he went along. I'm sure that there are some families that had that commissioned multiple portraits, but it seems like there was uh, quite a demand. If we remember that little cartoon of people lined up outside of his studio, um, I think he didn't have just one patron that kept him going. I think that there was a line out the door of people who were waiting um, to have their chance with him. And I would say if I could resurrect any artist and force him to paint me, it would be Sargent. So he's still got a line. <laughs> um, did he receive training in painting in watercolors or was he self-taught? That's a really good question, Donnie. Offhand, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I I, I believe I remember reading that his mother actually gave him some training in that as a young man, as a boy, really. And his father, I remember having been a doctor, was kind of uh, training him in medical illustration, but it's his mother, I believe, trained him in watercolors. And it seems like it was it was like the, the medium that he really connected with and almost like a creative outlet for him, as opposed to doing something of like a forced commission. So it seems like something that he kind of naturally developed because of his personal interest there. What is the best place to see a large cross section of his works? Well, we're so lucky because in Boston, we've got those great examples at the Sar at the Gardner Museum and then um, uh, at the MFA as well, we can just walk across the street. Um, but I would say that every major art museum in America, like if they're worth their salt, they have at least one Sargent picture um, in their collection. We, I was joking about this when, it, when I was doing an Edward Hopper um, presentation too. It's like, if you have an American collection, there are certain people you want represented. But I, I think um, the Gardner and, and the MFA are, are really have, have outstanding um, examples of his work. Um, plus there are, um, the, there are also murals at the MFA and at the Boston Public Public library. So like I said, so lucky there. Thank you so much for these kind words, everybody. I so appreciate it. And it seems like a lot of people were wondering if it was um, recorded, and I believe it was. How old when he was he when he started to peak? And how, or wait, how old was he when he started? How old would, was he when he was at his peak? So some of those pictures that we looked at today that, I mean, look masterful to me. I mean, he was in his early twenties. He was like 24 years old. Um, it's incredible to think about creating something that has that kind of lasting impact on humanity at such a young age. Michelangelo was certainly doing the same thing, but, um, but he was, he, he really, um, um, sort of seized upon what he was capable of, so well of doing at an early age and he and he um, and he blossomed with it and how old was he at the peak of his career so he died when he was 69 um, and I would say he was making um, watercolors really beautiful watercolors pretty late into his life so um, so the portrait part of his career probably ended um, or came to like a, 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 a an end right around 1900. 1905. But, you know, whether or not that was his peak is probably up for debate. 
which museums own the bulk of his watercolors? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, that I don't know. That's another one where it's like every museum wants at least a few of them. <laughs> um, but I, I would imagine that Boston museums uh, have some great uh, watercolors in their collections. Thank you so much. Oh, you guys are saying such kind things. I really appreciate it. Where would we find most of his World War I pictures? Um, I'm not sure how many there are, but um, it seems that the Royal Academy in London would be um, a good resource to explore for that. Is this last painting a watercolor or an oil? This is an oil and I apologize. I don't think I have the institution where it is housed on my notes over here. I apologize for that. It is a real stunner, isn't it? So and, I, yeah. I want to assure <clears throat> Ruth, I think we might have made it to the end of the questions. If another okay. one pops up, just, yeah. just take it away. Um, Ruth, there are more. This is the second in a five part series the first Thursday of every month from now until March. Next January, January 6th is um, Frenemies, the art world's greatest rivalries. Jane, did you wanna give some sort of a, um, a little preview? Oh yes, so about? we're going to be looking at three major rivalries, Michelangelo and Da Vinci, um, Turner and Constable, and then we're going to finish up with Picasso and Matisse. There's a lot of like scandal embedded in that one, which is a lot of fun. Big personalities, big egos. It's pretty wonderful. Um, Paulette just asked, was he ever married? I think he was a confirmed bachelor. Yep. And, and it is being recorded. You will find the, the link on the Burlington Public website. And I believe our sponsoring, our collaborative libraries, uh, Tewksbury and Stevens Memorial will have the link on their websites as well. You can go to your home library to sign up for the next program. You'll need to register, it's via Zoom. And um, I hope to get the link out tomorrow, if not tomorrow, Monday. Thank you so much, Marnie. Thank you, Jane. Wonderful program. I Thank love you. it. Thank it's you. my pleasure. Have a great night, everyone. Take oh, care. one last thing. Ah, I oh. want to thank the friends of the Tewksbury Library, Stevens Memorial Library, and Burlington Public Library for sponsoring. Yes. Thank you and good night. Thanks. Good night.